Among the numerous ways one can make a living, dealing in arms, aside from legs and ears, of course, is, well, definitely one way to go about it. Naturally, there's little good to be said about a merchant of death, but it was without a doubt an eventful profession, which is why you see it's such a popular trope in fiction. But how did being an arms dealer come about, and what was it actually like? Well, weapons have been sold since practically forever. Get your caveman clubs, one for a rock, two for a sabre tooth! But prior to industrialization, arms dealing was a very low volume affair. Guns were hard to make and expensive, so there just weren't that many to go round. I mean, of course, they were still traded. The Portuguese and the Dutch, our usual suspects, had been selling a couple of thousand firearms here and there since the 16th century. And yet, arms dealing didn't really take off until the Industrial Revolution. And that leads us, as always, to our dear Great Britain. <laughs> mm, yes. From the 1850s onwards, we see a veritable explosion in the number of private weapons manufacturers. Chief among them were the Armstrong, Nordenfelt and Maxim companies, which combined innovation with mass production to deadly results. Their biggest client was, of course, the Crown. What with empire building and all that, yet beyond Her Majesty's arsenal, pardon the expression, there were more than a few eager customers. Obviously, selling weapons to rival powers like France or Germany was a no bueno, or however you say it. But, uh, oh, look, there's a rebellion in China. Oh, and the Japanese are fighting the Russians. So, unfortunately, for humanity in general, the late 19th and early 20th centuries provided ample demand for weapons, and the rising British arms industry was more than happy to oblige. Its agents were unscrupulous men, and none was more unscrupulous than Basil Zaharoff. Originally from Greece, he toured the world pretending to be a Russian aristocrat. It charmed his way into the global elite managing, among other things, to plunder a railroad company in St. Louis, and to marry one of the wealthiest bachelorettes in Philadelphia. Then, in the wake of the glorious British conquest of, um, I mean liberation of Cyprus, where Zaharoff happened to be staying at the time, he found a lucrative opportunity. You see, the old Ottoman arsenal on the island was of no use to the crown, but it could be sold at a considerable markup to the right people. For example, the Greeks, still yearning to reclaim their lost lands. Conveniently, Zaharoff happened to be friends with one of the most renowned Greek diplomats at the time, who would eventually become Prime Minister. And that definitely helped speed things along. Now, I mean, one could easily imagine what Mr. Zaharoff would have thought back then. If peddling old arms was this lucrative, imagine what it would be like selling the new stuff. <laughs> oh my. Meanwhile, back in London, da -da 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 -da, he found the biggest underdog in the British arms industry, Thorsten Nordenfeld. He was originally from Sweden, and while he did have factories in England, he lacked connections to the upper echelons of society, which was exactly what Zaharoff could help with. They actually took the world by storm. Nordenfeldt had a knack for inventing dangerous technology with questionable safety standards, and Zaharoff had the unmatched talent of hyping it up. Let's get ready to rumble! Or whatever the equivalent was back then. When Nordenfeldt created the world's first ever torpedo-bearing submarine in 1884, Zaharoff made no delays in selling a prototype back home in Greece. Then he told the Ottomans about it and promptly sold them two submarines. But now that the Turks had submarines, well, the Russian Black Sea Navy was no longer safe. So they bought three submarines, which reminds me of a book, Why You Need Insurance, by Just In Case. <laughs> now, in reality, the Nordenfeldt submarine was a glorified human oven, prone to overheating and turning upside down. But why let such details get in the way of such a profitable transaction? Of course, not all of Nordenfeldt's products were shams. Their machine gun was top of the line, for its time, capable of firing 3,000 rounds in three minutes. It wasn't the best. That honor went to the Maxim gun, 
But that was no problem for Zaharov. He simply sabotaged his opponent's demonstration whenever the two competed for the same contract. Such lofty ethics. However, Maxim was backed by powerful allies, I tell you. The company's largest shareholder and honorary SideQuest board member was Nathaniel Rothschild, a man not fond of losing money. When he got wind of Zaharov's dealings, he called up Nordenfeldt and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He would merge his company with Maxim's, retaining Zaharov so he could market their combined product line. After the deal went through, Nordenfeldt would suffer a string of unfortunate accidents. Ultimately going bankrupt and selling all his shares for pennies on the dollar. Lord Rothschild would perfect his takeover strategy over the next two decades, successfully merging with Vickers and Armstrong. All the while, Zaharov would continue selling weapons to the highest bidder sometimes even to the enemies of Britain itself. By 1914, he had supplied machine guns to nearly every future participant in the Great War. And in the aftermath of Germany's disarmament, Zaharov was instrumental in setting up a chain of affiliates through which to funnel arms of questionable legality. And we all know how that went. Ultimately, Zaharov would not live to see the fruits of his efforts, though not before spending his last two days on Earth burning all his notebooks and journals. They shall never know about that weekend on the French Riviera. Unlike Mr. Zaharov, we here at SideQuest prefer earning our keep without plunging the world into devastating conflicts. It's our lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's a life. If you'd like to see more of these little adventures of ours, consider supporting us on Patreon. Though, of course, we'll also appreciate it if you share our videos with your friends and loved ones. And, of course, any aspiring arms dealers you happen to know. Anyhow, we shall discuss more lucrative business opportunities in the not-too-distant future in the next competitively cutthroat episode of SideQuest. I don't like the word gun. Whenever I say it, people get triggered.